Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our set of uh, public lectures, popular, popular lectures about the risk of physics. Uh, we're happy to welcome you who sit here alive in the audience and also you who sit there behind the screens in Zoom. Uh, so this is the first lecture of our series, which will consist of 10 lectures. Six of them will happen here in Stockholm and four of them are happening in Uppsala. Uh, we are going to discuss the subjects which are fundamental, which are in the roots of nature, and which actually are there no matter what happens here on earth. But the reason for us to discuss these things and uh, to come up with these lectures is of course uh, the things which are happening now in and around, around Ukraine. We are not going to discuss this in more details here during the lectures, but uh, you are all advised to follow the information which we have presented in the website and uh, consider supporting the charities and uh, other initiatives which fight against this war. So the first lecture will be given by Dima Wolin, who is a professor at Uppsala University. Uh, this is about quantum mechanics, please. So I suppose you can hear me well now with the microphone. Uh, thank, you, thank you for coming, and I will jump directly to the subject. Thank you for such a good introduction. Uh, but still, I would, want, would like to start with something. Yeah, so it works now. Um, before we go to quantum mechanics, I would like to discuss something else, namely uh, organizational principle of why these lectures are happening the way they're organized. And to this, I would like to recall a movie uh, from late 20th century. And if you're roughly of my age, then you definitely know it. It's called Men in Black. It's about secret agencies that uh, take care of aliens that live on Earth. And we are going to discuss actually uh, this guy, Agent J. Uh, at the very first movie, he was recruited to the agency and he has to pass a test. So this is a, a Agent J for a future one. And there was, uh, they had to, all the contest contestants of the test had to fight uh, and uh, remove streets from the street of a city. And everybody was shooting uh, scary looking monsters, but uh, he made a correct choice and shoot that girl. And the reason was, well, she was uh, bearing the book of quantum physics. So it, you probably can see it right here. So it doesn't matter how scary you are. I mean, so this is definitely qualifies to be shoot. Uh, so to be more precise, of course, he did not shoot for quantum physics, but for the fact that this is believed to be very complicated. And this is a small, small girl. Uh, who is not supposed to study quantum physics yet. So uh, is it a complicated subject? Well, I'm doing this for my life, uh, science in particular quantum physics. I even teaching them uh, it at university. And I must say that it's no more complicated than uh, for pianists to, to play piano, for painters to uh, paint picture. Uh, it's a question of uh, skill and professionalism that you develop by working on the subject. So what is really complicated about quantum physics is intuition. Uh, even if I don't uh, play piano uh, seriously, uh, and almost don't play at all, uh, I still can probably appreciate beauty of music, uh, but to appreciate beauty behind quantum mechanics is very difficult because it appeals to the fundamental uh, things. Uh, it appeals to some knowledge which you don't experience in everyday intuition. And this is what I want to speak first. So I would like to challenge you with uh, what I would call three-digit empirical rule. 
I will say the following thing. If the system scale changes by a factor of 1,000, then we need a qualitatively different uh, description of the system. So let's give an example. Uh, along this course, uh, we will always compare different scales, how big things and how, how big things are and how small things are. And for instance, we can compare these uh, Flintstones to the size of uh, Patasaurus. So Patasaurus is uh, 10 times bigger and it's huge compared to them, but it's uh, only 10 times bigger. What I'm speaking about is thousand times bigger. So let's zoom in. So this one will be, if you try to fit 200 meters on the size of the screen, there will be 10 apatosauruses. And these tiny things here are uh, 1,000, no, 100 apatosauruses, which correspond to putting them in line of uh, two, two kilometers. If I were to put, put Flintstones in the same line, it will be 1,000 of them, uh, then you actually wouldn't even see them. So I did not do this, but instead I will arrange them into a square. So I will put 10 times 10 square. So it is you see something. Uh, so this is one Flintstone uh, multiplied uh, 100 times, but a 10 times by, by 10 square. And, but it's 10 times zoom of, of, of this linear scale. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to zoom out, uh, out from this picture 1,000 times. And so this dot here is original Flintstone. It's just a pixel on the screen. And I tell, tell you a secret, PowerPoint refused to draw it and I have to scale twi time, two times bigger than actually it is. So this is actually two times two, and I see four Flintstones there. So this is uh, 10 by 10, and this is 100 by 100, and this is uh, 1,000 by 1,000. And here is just a gray uh, thing, which is all color being mixed, and you definitely cannot understand uh, that there are some human behind at all. And uh, that's a different story now. But what the story is? Well, in reality, if you look on Google Maps, so this is two kilometers. So two kilometers by two kilometers is the size of Gamla Stan. And so is this the size of a small city? And we speak about city, we do not speak about uh, directly human behavior. We speak about sociology and how management, how organized city running. It's completely different questions and need completely different tools. By the way, uh, this is two kilometers in, in size. What if multiply by 10? Well, if you multiply by 10, you get apatosaurus, right? And apatosaurus, so 20 kilometers, actually maximum 30 kilometers, is the biggest cities on Earth. It's like Mexico City or uh, uh, Tokyo uh, City. So uh, maximum 30 kilometers is uh, human agglomeration. After this, it becomes fields. But OK, let's keep going and multiply size of uh, this small city, Gamla Stan, by a factor of 1,000. Well, what comes next, comes next the size of Sweden. Sweden. So Sweden is actually uh, from south to north, it's 1,600 uh, kilometers. And it's roughly uh, 1,000 times bigger than uh, Afghanistan. And uh, when you speak about countries, it's become a completely different story and we have to study politics. But now something interesting happens from the point of view of physics. So if uh, we are live in three dimensions, so this is two-dimensional story, but if you live in three dimension and put 1,000, uh, so we take a cube of size 1,000 by 1,000 by 1,000 and put as many flints inside, then what will happen, not 1,000, 1 million, right? We did 1,000 and 1,000 more, so 1 million flints on each side. Then what happened then, that gravitational attraction between flintstones become important and they will become a planet. So a uh, moon in diameter is actually twice as big as uh, Sweden in, 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 in uh, south to north. Earth is 10 times bigger than uh, moon and Jupiter is 10 times bigger than Earth. There is also interesting story about this distance. Moon cannot come much, much closer to Earth because it will be destroyed by tidal forces. And uh, so this distance is actually compatible with other scales here. And these tidal forces destroy all the satellites, uh, many satellites around uh, Saturn forming the rings. Uh, right, but now the quick question, okay, what about if you do 1,000 more? So what we are going to do, if you take Jupiter and put 10 times bigger than orbit around it and put everything with mass, then something new happens. This is the size of, a sun, of our sun, of our sun. And what happens then, the gravity becomes so strong that fusion ignites, uh, fusion reaction is ignited and we have a star. 
And it's again, a new physics you have to study because, uh, well, uh, you describe fusion, you need completely different principles compared to all I described before. And you now you can, can keep going. Uh, so if you notice here, uh, four order of magnitudes, we get the size of solar system as measured, I think, by heliosphere. Uh, then uh, three times be, uh, three zeros more, it's distance between uh, stars in our, in our galaxy. And uh, four times more is actually galaxies itself. And similarly, distance between galaxies, just compare Earth and distance to, to the next kind of quasi planet. And finally, just four more zeros and we get observable universe. So uh, if you think that this thing, this uh, guys here is just like a big version of moon around the earth, it's actually not true. There are quite a bit of new physics happening there. And we have lecture number five about gravity and one event in Uppsala when we'll discuss it. So physics here is actually not, it's way more than just physics about moon rotating and earth. It will be something well, dark, dark energy, dark matter, inflation and so on. But it's a completely different story. What I want to convince today that at every time you multiply by 1,000, you have different laws to apprehend and like. So far, we went uh, up in scales. And of course, you're going to quantum mechanics, so you have to go down. So three scales down, one millimeter. One millimeter is, uh, is a size for skin, basically. We have to study tissues. Uh, three scales down, so it's the size of a single atom organism, and a little bit more is uh, nucleotides, uh, like uh, DNA and RNA codes. So coronavirus is 10 to the minus seven meters. Three more, we have molecules. And then one more, we finally have atoms. So I try to convince along the way that every time we change by a factor of thousand, our system is completely new world. So how can we expect that atomic physics, which we did it three times at least from uh, our normal existence is the same as us. So of, but of course we should not expect it and it is not quite not the same. And actually this is a mockery because it's not how hydrogen atom looks like, it's how people imagined it hundred years ago. It's very crude approximation of what's really happening. There is also important distinction in the story because roughly until here, I can still use law, law of classical physics, just balance between different laws, make a different uh, feeling. But if you go down to this level, then even laws of classical physics do not apply any longer. So what you have to understand is that eventually you should give up intuition and accept something new. Here I discussed uh, only scales in distance, how things small or big. But in reality, we have other options. We can make things very massive or very fast, or we actually can have many of things, just many copies of the same thing. And each of these could completely change how we describe the system. And this is, for instance, four of the topics we are going to discuss in the lecture. Then there are some interesting combinations. The fast and small will be quantum field theory. And there is also example when this is not massive, but actually very small mass, actually mass less, zero mass. Then it will be light. We will have lecture in Uppsala about waves and light. It's a different story again. So what we are going to do through this uh, months, we are going to, to do this exercise in all possible direction and every time find something interesting. Today we are focusing on this corner small. And uh, I will split this talk in two parts before and after the break. Before the break, uh, I will accept as we are human beings, we have intuition based on everyday experience and we will try to explain quantum mechanics by appealing to what you know the best, is, uh, waves and particles. So this is like what is called old quantum mechanics. This by the way gives pretty re reasonable understanding of many things. We can understand tunneling, interference, uh, quantization of bound systems. I mean, this is some quantum terms, uh, the points we can explain them because we know about waves. It's waves are known for, for, for humanity for many centuries. And this, the, all these effects are known in waves under different names. They, they are not new effects. They are new only in the sense that they applied in new situation. And also this part, collapse of wave function to probabilistic description, this looks like very new. But in reality, very similar happens in statistical physics. It's like phase transition and probability statistical physics. We discuss next time a lot about this. What is different is different interpretation. And here probability is a fundamental feature, not imagined. This is it was different, but at least we can grasp the concept. This is uh, 
what I want to try to convey. But eventually, if we want to be serious about quantum mechanics, you have to give up the idea to be always uh, classical objects to explain everything. You have to go beyond. And this is, I will touch a little bit on the second part. Because when we do uh, uh, speak about vector spaces, uh, unitary evolution and symmetries, then first of all, all this is included, but also we can understand better what is spin. We can better understand what is indistinguishable particles and angle of states. And there will be lecture number four, which is called quantum field theory. It's next level of quantum mechanics. And there, if you try to stay here, you're basically you're doomed. So we discuss much more in lecture four again, uh, because there, this approach become corner store to actually understand what's happening with these elementary particles. And okay, hopefully grow up. Uh, this group, little girl will grow up and uh, will not be shot uh, by agent from man, man in black. So this was an introduction, and now the main event, which is quantum mechanics. We start with this attempt of quasi-classical perspective. You attempt to use familiar object, but uh, combine them anew to explain quantum mechanics. The first thing we have to discuss is the famous effect of observer. Um, so why we speak about observing? Because in classical world, we are used to the fact uh, that if we, uh, so ball can travel from point A to point B, and when we observe it, actually we do not influence it. But uh, if you try to observe electron traveling from point A to point B, this slide, which is used to actually observe it, so this is our Schrodinger head observing uh, uh, electron. Uh, this slide, which is used to actually give information to cut, actually pushes electron away. And by mere observation of electron, uh, we change what happens with it. So if you want to, uh, to keep system intact, we are not allowed to observe it. But then the question arises, if you are not allowed to observe it, is it even there? Because you have no means to confirm it. So this is a famous phrase, if a tree falls in the forest and there is no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Uh, yeah. Uh, so in quantum mechanics, it becomes question of, of uh, existential question for, for, for physicists. Uh, if you cannot observe a system, what it actually doing? Because you cannot confirm this. Just to tell you that uh, physicists maybe become uh, caring about this uh, only 100 years ago, well, of course, before, but it was become serious. Uh, it became serious, but uh, humanity, of course, thought about this for centuries. So there was a philosopher, uh, Bishop George Berkeley, uh, who actually uh, was saying exactly the same thing. According to, you, to us, the unthinking being perceived by science have no existence distinct from being perceived and cannot therefore exist in any other substance. So it was a big paragraph. I found the most comprehensible phrase, I, I promise you, in that paragraph. At least this one I put on the stand. So this, if this, there is no sentient being observing the object, it actually doesn't exist. And of course, there was a lot of criticism, for instance, this one. This is comprehensible. I observe that so, though we are satisfied that his doctrine is not true, it is impossible to refute it. I mean, how can we refute it uh, if we cannot observe? Uh, right, anyway, so what, why was the curious also about? Because this George Berkeley happened to, to work in Ireland and also happened to work in Ireland many centuries later. So this is Berkeley Library, and this is where I actually was giving lectures to students. So uh, every day I was passing home through this place, never thought that I will ever connect uh, to things. So this is a Trinity College uh, Dublin. Uh, Dublin. Right, so just to say that, uh, yeah, it's not really this quantum physics that we have to ask these questions much before. But now we are forbidden to observe, and let's reformulate the question, uh, is it electron even there? What we can say, okay, we can assume it is there. And if you assume, then we have mass to follow. And if we follow mass, then we can make predictions. If you make predictions, we can check predictions. And uh, will be they satisfied or not? So this, to be honest, we do the same with classical picture. In classical picture, we actually can observe, but we won't, right? Just to, to be honest with ourselves. So in classical world, we are going to use mass to make prediction what will happen with the ball. And the answer will be yes. 
our prediction is true. But what happens funny, very interesting, that in quantum world, when we make a prediction, that's not what the experiment shows. The experiment shows that our prediction is wrong. And in this sense, uh, Bishop Berkeley was right. Electron in the sense is not there in the sense what we intuitively imagine is not actually happening. We, of course, cannot know what is happening, but definitely not what we imagine by being classical beings. Something else is happening. And to explain what is happening, I have to do an explanation of double slit experiment. So this is a very famous subject, and it was popularized by famous lectures of physics, which was already uh, 60 years ago. There was, there was a audio was recorded online. You can listen to them and read. Just to make it clear, I did not go and read the lectures. We actually had a long brainstorm discussion what should we speak about during the lectures. So it took us two hours and we wrote a lot of things on two whiteboards. And I spent more than a week thinking what I actually will speak about. And I converged to the same idea and I just stopped and, and yeah, it's kind of the same, but it sounds like the correct thing to do. So if you're not satisfied what I'm going to say, uh, you can find better authority and go to online and check. It will be the same story, but tell told probably different. So what is the story? Uh, well, suppose we have electron gun, which shoots electron one by one, and there is a screen which will uh, receive electron. So this is point A and this is point B. So we have no possibility to know what is electron between because we do not want to observe it with Schrodinger gun. But what we can do, we can put a small hole, and if our classical idea is correct, then electron must pass through this small hole because otherwise he, it will crash on the on this barrier, right? So it must. So we at least hope we cannot observe, but we hope it passes. And indeed, uh, what we'll observe, we will shoot with the electron gun many many times, that most of the time electron will land in this region, which is in, in front of uh, this hole. Sometimes, for some reason, it will show you. Uh, uh, land far away, but it's rare well. So majority of the time, uh, landed here correlated with, uh, with this uh, opening. And so we can say, actually, it's quite probable that Alicon actually passed through this hole. Yeah, this is an experiment that you can do and confirm. Uh, but so actually, we can also move, move uh, if you, even if the gun is here and, and the slit is uh, to some angle from the gun, still we will see this accumulation. Uh, we move here, see accumulation, see move here, accumulation. And it's confirmed that idea that accumulation of where electron land actually follow the position of the slit. But what uh, if you open two slits? So this is what we expect. We have two slits. So classically, we say electron passes through here, it will land here, or it passes through here, then it will land here. So we expect to see this picture. But actual experiment shows us very, very different thing. And it actually, again, the idea that electron passes here or there. To be honest, people actually checked something. Uh, they checked that if you actually uh, confirm that electron was passing through the slit, this would be correct picture as outcome. So remember what I told you, if you observe things, they can change and they actually do change. This is what we'll see if you try to observe the electron and this is what we'll see if we will not observe the electron. Okay. Uh, now a little bit of mass. Uh, so people uh, studied for quite a while and they come up with some mass, uh, which will pass integral, how to, to compute these things. Uh, so uh, what you have to do, uh, so this is mathematical, uh, so the idea is the following, okay, classical mathematics will not work, but let's change mathematical model, model and make a prediction, uh, make some computation, which is consistent with this experiment. So what we have to do, we have to compute something that is called complex amplitude. Uh, so complex amplitude, uh, uh, well, it's a complex number, which depends on this path of an electron. And if not to use complex numbers, then we can think about this arrow on a clock. So it's like a clock and this arrow will rotate. And uh, the idea when a particle passes uh, on the path, this arrow will rotate. And the, this is kinetic energy, this is potential energy. And the faster particle passes, uh, the faster it will rotate. And the more obstacles it has, the slower it rotates. And there are only obstacles actually will rotate over the direction. And then uh, we have some cartoon here. So 
So uh, you see that uh, blue is up, uh, blue is lower pass and red is upper pass. And when particle moves, uh, this arrow rotates. And if originally they will align in the same direction, this time they will align not in the same direction. Yeah, you hopefully see it here very explicitly. Okay, but what is the rule eventually? So we have two amplitudes uh, from this path and from this path. Uh, so we have a red path and blue path. Then we have to compute total amplitude, which is we have to add these two lines using vector uh, like vectors. So in this case, they will add in this yellow line and square of this distance. So square of this distance is actually will be probability to find particle in this uh, corner. If you follow other paths, uh, if you want to come to other point, uh, then actually this arrows will add differently and then actually can be opposed to one another. And then yellow line will be very small and probability to find a uh, particle in different point will be very small. Then probability to find particle different places will change depending on where you compute it. But the most important I want to say here is that in order to compute probability to find particles somewhere, we actually have to consider both possibilities for electron to pass. So in this model, electron is not passing through one slit, it's actually somehow passes through both simultaneously. Um, so this was example with two slits, red pass and blue pass, what I just told, uh, point X. What if you have three passes? Well, then we actually have to consider uh, three slits. Then we have to consider all three passes. This is all total amplitude to be sum of three options. And this also gives you some result. And this also we can compute and confirm the experimental data. What if you have very many slits? Then we actually have to go through all possible ways of the slits compute uh, amplitude for each of the option, add them together, take a square. This is how it computes. And we can make so many slits then, uh, that basically uh, this is almost not existing stuff. It's almost only holes. So we can, in the limit, we can have so many slits that there are no slits at all. There is no barriers at all. And then we have to sum over all possible trajectories. And it can be a very fancy one. One which flying to the moon, coming back, another one. And we have to sum over all of them this actually, when we sum over that many things, you usually don't like to call it sum, you call it integral. And it's called path integral, Feynman path integral. So that's how we compute probability to find particles here. And what is uh, funny about this, if H1 constant can be assumed to be small, then actually there will be one trajectory which uh, dominates everybody else. Everybody else is canceled, and this is a classical trajectory. So in the classical world, electron will be uh, legitimately be somewhere concretely. This will be classical intuition. Okay, real life pass integral. So uh, when I was PhD student, I, I, I lived in Bursary, right, south of Paris. And this is, I lived here, and this was my work. And actually this is a hill, very steep hill with a lot of trees. And I have to find a way to go to work. And first month, I actually try all possible ways. So this yellow different passes I try to, this actually, now it's empty, but before it was lake. I cannot see more over the lake. So if you choose the wrong path, you have to go over the whole lake. And I tried to, nice, so this is nice uh, road with asphalt, but then it becomes a field and it's very hard to pass here. So this is very nice cycle road, uh, but by foot is not as nice. And uh, actually also can try take a train, uh, go to other, other, other train station, take a bus and actually quite fast, uh, but not as fast. So eventually this white line is a, uh, the optimal way to, 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 to travel to my work, which I find, found after one month of trial, because actually it's very, very small passage in the forest, you cannot immediately notice. Uh, so the point that uh, there are many options to go to work and eventually human uh, chooses the one which is the optimal one. So uh, nature is more clever in using quantum mechanics, it tries all possible uh, options at the same time and in classical world, it chooses one, which is classical. But in quantum world, it stays in the all possibilities together. OK, this was theory. What about experiment? Uh, actually, the theory was completed, started to be considered by experiment in 1961. And 2013, uh, we have, uh, I took this picture from this 2013 paper. So this is actually, uh, if you see here, it's actually double slits which are open and we have interference patterns of electrons. This is 
some variable points are more often, some variables less often. And if you have only one slit, you do not have any interference. So this is experimental confirmation. By now, what I say abstractly as thoughts actually was confirmed and like uh, not that like 60 years ago. And moreover, we spoke about telectron, but these days people even confirm them for very huge molecules. So this molecule has 400 atom and um, it's already 10, 10 times bigger than size of a small atom. And uh, it's actually, it's uh, the Broglie wavelength is 100 times smaller. And it is very, very clever interferometer that allows to measure this uh, pattern, which is exactly like a double slit. It's not a double slit experiment, but something similar. And it's very funny that they actually use laser as a slit. So this is actually laser wave. And this is not only a slit, this is actually a potential which uh, accelerates this phase, uh, I mean, this amplitude rotation here and decelerates it here. And that's how they actually could see this pattern. So this really huge molecule and they still can confirm that it has quantum behavior. Okay, but uh, you know what? Uh, it's the first experiment about this double slit, or at least similar to it, was done in 1961. But people by 1932 already knew all essential laws of quantum mechanics. So definitely they didn't do double slit to confirm quantum mechanics, but what they actually did to come to the same conclusion and what happened eventually they predicted that should happen, uh, popularized by Feynman and eventually it was confirmed by experiment. What people did uh, to, to actually get to quantum mechanics. So we've come to the third part of quantum mechanics history and Schrodinger equation. Well, uh, I will not go to ancient degrees, it's too far away, but I will go to time of Newton. So people for a long time know that there are waves like here and there are particles. So uh, there was a long term debate about whether light is wave or particle. And you think people thought about is it this was wave? Actually, no. Newton himself thought that light was a collection of particles. And it was because of his uh, double uh, prism experiment. And this was it's because of geometric optics, because in geometric optics, light propagates by straight line. And it's very easy to imagine that there's a particle follow a straight line. Huygens, on the contrary, thought it was way, but for 100 years, people didn't believe Huygens, they believed Newton. And until 1803, when Young did double slit. So this is modern version of double slit for, for, for light, which he took from Wikipedia. Uh, and then, uh, so double slit, it's on the water, this is double slit, it's one ball, another ball. So it's very nice video on YouTube you can watch. And you see that there is this pattern. So here it's more probable to find waves, here is less probable. This is interference pattern, so it's similar to here. So when Young did his experiment with double slit, it was kind of everybody started to believe that light is waves, and eventually we have Maxwell equations that are wave equations, and well, it's so great. So people really thought it was wave. But story is very interesting because this time people get to a photoelectric effect. And Einstein explained that the photoelectric effect can be explained is light is absorbed by a small quantum, which is quantum photon. And then uh, it's not Einstein, sorry. Uh, uh, it's a little bit, uh, um, so it's not this guy either, but uh, it was 1909. I forgot, uh, I don't remember the name by heart now, sorry. Uh, so I just, this is very nice video from YouTube, uh, Brown Physics Demos. I, I really visit to make a like to these guys. I, it's really showing what you want to see. I wanted to see for a long time. Let, let us see how this double slit, for photons that can be done in real life, I'm sure in the, in the audience. Okay, I will uh, uh, make loud for him because it's something unhearable. So what here is source of single photons shining on this uh, photo multiplier. And this has somewhere here is a double slit. So the point that single photon can be recorded only in one place like an electron. And this is, he actually explains this one, the single photon flying through double slit coming here and eventually it will be recorded by one place. And here's a screen here, it will come there now, which actually shows what happened on this photo multiplier. Yeah. Did, that's much better explanation that I do. It takes more time, right? So. Yeah. 
You see single photons are flashing. They're flashing like particles, not like waves. And now he's going to collect statistics. So he will just collect how, what happened this time. So now it memorizes all the flashes of photons. And this time, let's see what happens. I hope it's clear, right? So it's statistically we have this interference pattern. It's not happening because wave superposes, but each, each photon superposes with itself through many paths interpretation, and eventually we have this pattern. So this was really amazing, and uh, not exactly this experiment, but the very similar of first time was uh, preserved, uh, presented in 1909, and after that. Um, and after that, uh, people actually uh, say, okay, actually light is probably particles. Then it was complete confusion and eventually a conciliation that, yeah, it propagates as a wave. So this is through two slits together, but when we measure it, we do measure it as particles. This is half of the story because another part of the story was about particles. Um, so it started again, for, well, it started before, but let's start from Newton and in his principle, the mathematical principles of natural philosophy, he just formulated Newton's laws of motion, which were clearly for particles. Then uh, they were reformulated with an LL Lagrange to the principle of least action. So principle of least action is something which is known in, in, in theory of flight as Fermat principle of least time. It's very similar. And then there was Hamilton in 1830 uh, who showed uh, that actually we can reformulate right on what's called hamilton jacobi equations now and they have the same meaning as geometric optics. So classical mechanics can be reformulated as geometric optics. So another funny part of my biography, Hamilton also lived in Dublin. And uh, I lived uh, one, one kilometer from the place he worked. And every day I walked to, uh, I was cycling to the job, to my job. I was covering the same route he was covering when he discovered quaterniums. This is another story, which is very funny. Uh, but uh, yeah, but uh, just to notice, Hamilton, is no, Hamilton, Sir Ron William Hamilton, is known as mathematician, but also he was astronomer, physicist. Foremost, he was optician. This is not everybody knows. His uh, early works were about optics, and this is actually saying that you know, guys, classical mechanics is the same as optics. This was very strange. There were then there were many 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 experiments, in particular Hadjian, when we will speak about them when they saw, okay, classical mechanics doesn't work and eventually Schrodinger wrote a wave equation. So, uh, which was wave equation for whom Hamilton Jacobi was uh, optics, uh, geometrical optics. So this is waves like Maxwell equations it's here. And uh, if you go to this uh, straight lines, it's geometric optics and Hamilton Jacobi is geometric optics for Schrodinger equation. So by the time people understood all the all this analogy, and already of course they thought about this experiment, and it took only 30 years more to actually do it. And Feynman formulated pass integral used it in the quantum field theory very successfully, and eventually people could confirm all the story and comment to okay, in the story, what is pass integral by Feynman? Well, it's very seriously updated Huygens principle. Just it's a little done a little bit more seriously and systematically. Uh, the more details, but if you do it very short, pass integrals of M, it's like a Huygens principle from a uh, theory of light. Okay, very quick uh, story about Kirchner equation. So this is a wave equation. You do not need to understand details, but the point is amplitude we computed uh, using pass integral is actually a solution to Schrodinger equation. And then so instead of solving this complicated integral, you actually can solve this equation and believe in this is super. Uh, often, not always. But, uh, when we solve Schrodinger equation, we actually can uh, simulate double split experiment. So this is uh, original electron, which is again, this is probability density everywhere and it propagates through double slits. Well, and uh, well, hopefully you can see clearly interference pattern happen. This is just numerical solution of Schrodinger equation. It's also funny to observe what happens at later stages. Okay, I do it. 
So it's, you know what it resembles to me? It's like water in the bathtub and light shines on the water. So it's very similar in perception. And you actually can see uh, resonance frequencies like, like, like in music here. Okay, uh, so I almost, oh, finally it's video. But uh, let's go, keep going. So because of lack of time, I will skip questions of tonal and quantization of energy levels, but you can discuss this during break if you're interested because uh, we can explain now what it is. And I want to say something about pilot vaccines because uh, people are not satisfied uh, with certain principles of quantum mechanics, so they try to find other, other things to do uh, to explain how this world acts. In particular, they do not like this idea that the particle is not somewhere. They say particle should be somewhere. This is really against uh, our intuition. And this is uh, usually pilot by serious is coming with these ideas. So quickly what it is. We have a Schrodinger equation. It's a mathematical equation. We make substitution of variables and uh, derive new equations, say sometimes post model long equations. Notice that this equation was done the same year that Schrodinger published his work. A model long acknowledges Schrodinger paper, but actually looked at both of them. Schrodinger equation never wrote uh, explicitly this term. Probably because this imaginary unit here, it's uh, square root of minus one. This was very scary to write in the physical world. However, of course, uh, I just read what he wrote. I think he knew that it could be written, but he never wrote it. Well, never wrote it until this paper. But Madeline actually in his paper, he wrote it explicitly because he has a good reason because with this term, he can get equations of hydrodynamics. And um, first of all, uh, we can write change relation hydrodynamics. It has practical application in, in uh, computer simulations. So this is a computation done by solving Schrodinger equation. This is actually a photograph. And even become more impressive. So first of all, it's called Schrodinger smoke. Go to YouTube and super nice video, look at it. It's using Schrodinger equation to solve equations of hydrodynamics, which is nonlinear differential equations. Uh, just now let's look in the video of the of this simulation. It's really nice. Is this a computer simulation? It's not video of real life. Okay. So just, just a small application because there is similarity between through this change of variables, there's possibility to equations of hydrodynamic out of Schrodinger equations, people can uh, do really nice computations. It's just mathematical fact. But anyway, if you believe that a hydrodynamic is an important thing, you're wrong. Because uh, uh, in reality, it boils to, to the question whether did you study classical mechanics well. Because this is easy consequence of hamilton jacob equations. So of course, uh, people know it, knew it for a long time. So this is actually a question. What is important is this term Q. It's proportional to Planck constant and it's called quantum potential. So in classical world, this term doesn't, is not there. And then it will be literally consequence of classical Hamilton Jacobi, classical mechanics. What, uh, and basically new is interpretation of this term. In quantum mechanics, standard interpretation we say, okay, all this is nice, but okay, we have a function, let's go to Schrodinger equation. Uh, in uh, this uh, pilot wave interpretation, we say that actually there is exist a wave in the ground which corrects classical potential with a new term, which is the Banach quantum force. And then particle, which actually physically exists, the belief that an existence of particle, even if you don't observe it, actually follows modified equations of motion with this quantum potential. So I must explain both approaches are mathematically equivalent. So far, there is no proposal of experiment, realizable experiment at least, that can distinguish between two. So for both mathematics, there is no much difference. Uh, but they, at least this, uh, what they did is people, they try to uh, come back to the idea that electron should be somewhere. Just they change equations of motion for electrons. They're no longer classical, but corrected with quantum corrections. And you know what? Uh, there is a very funny experiment which shows the idea. So this is bouncing a droplet of, 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 of oil on the water surface, opposite way around, drop of water on the oil surface, I don't remember. And uh, what it, when it bounces, uh, it actually cannot uh, go down because there is some vibration, it creates waves. And these waves uh, actually influence the particle and uh, uh, control its motion. So this is a pilot wave of this part. I will show you a video, you go to the break, but before I show the video, just notice, this is nice illustration 
but equations of motion that are not quantum equations of motion. So it's similar analogy, equations are different. But uh, th this idea of pilot vet is actually was realized uh, in classical systems. This is classical system, it will be quantum world. So this is actually diffraction through single slit experiment. You can go to this uh, website to see more. So again, there is no claim that this explains quantum mechanics, but it gives you some new perspective on what it can do. And uh, with this uh, picture I showed, I finished the first part of the lecture. Uh, so we will have a 30 minutes break now uh, until uh, 20 past seven. During this break, uh, you're welcome to speak with us. And uh, so Sasha said about this, I just put it on the slide. So please go to the website and uh, participate for the reason of this event. Um, Okay, so uh, we meet at uh, 20 past seven to continue, and uh, then I will be less intuitive and more real. Mm. Yeah, I have a question. You talked about Navier Stokes and Schrodinger, and I was taught that uh, I'm an engineer, and I was taught that this Navier Stokes, uh, this doesn't have a solution or something like this. It's super complicated to solve. Okay. This is it's that not that so this is not a solution. It's it's the it's thing. equation. It's not a solution. Okay. It just, so first of all, Navier Stokes in zero viscosity fluid. Actually, Navier Stokes there is one more term which makes it even even worse. So it's already simplification, but even this equation is super hard to solve. Uh, not that the solution doesn't exist. It's hard for a human to solve it even using computer. Okay. And what these guys did, uh, well, what is this? these guys did, they solved it numerically using very clever tool, Schrodinger equation, which is usually what most people in hydrodynamics will not think about. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay. Come back, everyone. Continue. Um, so now uh, we are going to go to the second part, uh, uh, which is about more honest explanation of quantum mechanics. But it also means that I'm not allowed to write much formulas. I will be also less detailed. But the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do something that we all in theory do. We are going to use Blackboard. I'm not just going to do karaoke, but write at least one thing on the Blackboard today. So what is this thing? Uh, remember, we had this experiment when we had uh, electrons uh, passing through some slits and landing to on the screen. And uh, actually, the question which we can ask, we have point X and point one, why, what is probability that uh, this electron end up at this point? Something like that. Uh, let us just uh, write a notation, uh, which is very useful, used very often in quantum physics. I will write uh, what is called cat. It's not cat, it's K-E-T, cat. It's just a name, and this will represent electron who is actually here. Actually, if you measure it, we know it's there, at least the moment we measure it. And we can say, okay, by this notation, it means electron is there. And likewise, I'm going to write another cat with Y inside and say, this means that electron at this position. 
what quantum mechanics tells us that if you do not do measurement of position, electron is not obliged to be here or there, it can be in both places simultaneously. But to quantify these, we have to introduce two numbers which were called amplitudes, a x and a y. So these are complex numbers. You should not really care much about this. Is, this is uh, this uh, arrows. And a x square is a probability that electron here, while a y square is a probability that electron is there. So this is just a mathematical notation that saying electron is either here or there. So this plus here means actually or. It's not like adding numbers, it means or. Just we used to write plus. And these are probabilities to find it here or there. So describe quantum system, we need to give these two numbers. And uh, this, by the way, is called vector in the Hilbert space. This is official mathematical name. Uh, now I want to make a leap uh, of uh, intuition or like conceptual perception. So here I really call that this is position of electron here and there. But from the other point of view, these are just two letters from uh, Latin alphabet. So this can signify any state X in principle. And this can be signified any other state which you call Y. Well, what could be examples? Uh, my favorite example is my child who is either asleep or awake. So X would be child asleep and Y will be child awake. And if you're a parent, then actually you know the child is a quantum system. You can never measure whether the child is asleep because by doing this, you can make wake uh, it up. Yeah. So just never go to the room where child may be sleeping. It's problem of observer. So the door is closed and child can be either asleep or awake. And there is a probability for this to happen. Notice I'm not going to write for you child is asleep, child is awake. I already write X and Y. This can be something else. This can be uh, electron orbit in the lowest uh, state uh, of energy in the atom. And this will be electron orbiting in the higher energy state in the atom. And of course, I can continue and say there are maybe more states. And how many states are possible depends on the system. The point that I forget about, uh, for the moment forget, not forever, but for the moment I forget was the physical interpretation of these letters. And every time I consider a different quantum system, I will have different physical interpretation. The point that every time I have a set of the possibilities, they all can simultaneously realize. And for each simultaneous realization, I have numbers which are called um, complex amplitude whose square is actually probability. And after we understand this, we build mathematical apparatus to work with this. Now we are no longer focusing about various electron. Maybe our question is different. What is energy of electron? Or maybe what is the speed of electron? Or something else, like this child sleeping or awake. The point is that, uh, to make it formal. I will not uh, go to the discussion more, but I will tell you something interesting again from history. It's again 1931. And this time it's uh, Wigner. Um, he, was he was discussing symmetry behind uh, this formulation. The word symmetry is about, if you have, like say, a triangle, if rotated by 120 degrees, uh, then it's keep being the same. This example of a symmetry. But also behind this formulation, there, is, there are some other symmetries, which I will not explain now. So uh, he was discussing these symmetries and he used all major symmetries that we know. So one symmetry of this world, if it translates, uh, coming back to Newton time, Galilean principle, if he change position where we stay, equations of motions are the same. If you rotate them, equations of motion are the same. In special relativity, which is number three lecture, we discuss more symmetries. And Wigner apply all the symmetries to this quantum system and explain what, possible, what types of particles are possible in the world. And indeed, this only this type of part of particles possible. 
uh, elementary particles as lectured number four, but their classification started with sigma analyzing symmetry of a quantum system. So I want to just emphasize that this abstract description about some state with some probability is very useful. And we have to abstract from the our chase of coordinate. Yeah, we are not do not know where is electron. We do not know until we measure it. But maybe we do not know to what. Do not want to know. Yeah. Makes difference. Okay. So this is very briefly about uh, Hilbert perspective. And uh, we come to explicit story, which is EPR paradox. Uh, well, uh, this time uh, here I spoke about two states X and Y. Now on this slide, uh, X and Y will be denoted as uh, blue and uh, blue and uh, oh, sorry, red and blue. But now we are going to use for two particles. So this will be left particle and right particle. So in total, there are four options. Uh, two blue, two red, one blue, one red, one red, one blue. So again, blue and red are not actual colors of particles. This is abstract states, whatever they mean. So uh, this, this has four uh, these are four possible results of a classical, well, of a measure. In quantum world, we have to add them. Uh, addition means or here with certain amplitude and a, a square means what is probability to find something on experiment. Okay, so one option plus another option plus num option number three plus option number four. Now we take a very specific state when uh, both particles are red or both particles of blue and give equal probabilities for both of them. So coefficients are the same in the probability cycle. And uh, we send left particle to Venus, to Alice, uh, living uh, on some orbital station around Venus. And we send red uh, right particle to Bob. Uh, the fact that the particles far away, until we actually measure them using special devices, doesn't uh, exclude the possibility for them to be in this uh, what is called uh, uh, superposed or entangled state. There are still uh, two options are possible. And uh, so now left particle went to Alice, we call it A, and right particle went to both, we call it B. And uh, let Alice actually do the measurement and ask, okay, what are you in which states is my particle? She can get two answers, red or blue. The moment she says that it is red, it's not only that uh, she knows her particle is red, but also this whole state, I mean, this whole state of quantum mechanics become reduced to this one. So this red red is like X and blue blue is like Y. When we uh, observed Alice observed particle red, she actually, what she did, she understood that our system in state X. But this also implies something for Bob, because now Bob can know for sure that his particle, which is another particle, is also red. And uh, Bob will observe only red particles. And if Alice observes blue, the same logic applies, but now states become this one. It will be NB, and Bob observes only blue particle. And the paradox that the result of the experiment uh, Alice makes is uh, influencing uh, what actually Bob is doing. However, they are very far away, and these influences happen faster than speed of light. Just to be clear, this was confirmed by experiment. It's not theoretical thought these days. So resolution of the paradox, uh, however, is in the fact that when Alice make a measurement, she doesn't have a control what she is going to measure. So if she decides to make measurement, she can get red or she can get blue. If she gets red, Bob will get red. If she gets blue, uh, Bob gets blue. But what she's going to get, she doesn't know. So Bob uh, will observe red and blue with probability on half each. 
So this is if Alice is going to do it. What is about Alice is not doing an experiment at all? Well, then these states are both with probability one half, and Bob will still observe uh, particles probability one half each. So conclusion, whether uh, Alice does experiment or not, Bob will observe uh, his experiment with probability one half, red or blue. So Bob has no possibility to know what Alice was doing. It's not Alice's measurement, but her decision is that it's information, and Bob cannot know about this. So this is a reason of paradox, but there is something more. It's about uh, this story if actually, uh, again, observer question, if actually system indeed in supposition of two. So let us make classical EPR paradox. I have two plates, circle, and uh, square. I mix them. I will give one plate to Sasha. I do not know what place is this. So what is your name? Alexei. So Alexei gets another plate. Sasha, what is your plate? Square. Alexei, you have circle. I know it instantaneously I spoke to Sasha. Does it sound strange? <laughs> Probably not, right? But this doesn't strange because when I was here, I already prepared what I'm going to give to Sasha and to Alexei. So the question, uh, the result of, let's say, uh, Alice experiment uh, uh, is doing an experiment. Whether her result is decided the moment particle created on Earth. So is it the moment when I was to click and I was on Earth, I was creating particles. Did by doing this and shuffling around, giving one uh, thing to Sasha, did I actually decide it already at that moment of time result of experiment? This is a question. Because I did, it's actually not when Alice is going to measure things when experiment happens really, but on Earth when I prepare it. Uh, or it's actually happening the moment when Alice does a measure. So actually uh, what I will give to Sasha is not determined by experiment. And people will say we're able using social mathematics, check it and use an experiment. This is called uh, Bell's inequality. Well, the statement that people checked experimentally that result of experiment is not decided on Earth. It's decided only the moment Alice makes a measurement. And here it's an interesting story about uh, fate and uh, question of whether we can make decisions. So in classical world, uh, using classical equations of motion, we say we have everything is deterministic. And this means that if you know in very big details our system, then everything is determined by solving Newton equations of motion. And in a sense, in this way, we say that we actually cannot, we do not any, do any decision. Everything is decided at the moment uh, now. All futures decided for us. It's just hard to control it, but it's decided. So this experiment uh, actually shows that uh, even if you know everything, it's impossible to know what will happen after. So it's amount of time things happen randomly. So in this sense, uh, you're not controlled by current things. Things can change differently. Uh, and from Kant's point of view, prediction of future is impossible. I mean, principle impossible. Whether it means you have control, this is uncertain because uh, things still happen randomly. So you don't have control what will happen in the experiment. And so far, science says that nobody has control from what we can measure at least. Okay. Um, so this was this paradox. Uh, Alice cannot influence Bob, but actually can we, uh, using this fancy quantum machinery, transfer information to Bob? Uh, I think I will not go to the, all the details, uh, but actually uh, there is a setup with three particles. I call it A, B, and C. 
So A, B is exactly this EPR pair that we discussed just a minute ago. Uh, that was prepared, as I told you, and sent to Venus and Mars. And C is a particle who lives in the realm of Alice. So Alice has a particle C, which is in her oven. Uh, this particle C is also a combination of red and blue states. So the question, is it possible to send uh, this information about this particle to Bob? And the answer is yes. Uh, but uh, disclaimer, I will not explain now how, but uh, disclaimer that uh, uh, you can send this information, but you need uh, to, to send by post. So Alice has to disclose the result of her experiment, this particle. So let me still explain a little bit because otherwise it was super unclear. So Alice has two particles, A and C. Uh, a is here and C is this one. She wants to see some complicated state uh, combination of C and blue. So it's not either red or blue, it's a combination of two. Alice wants to send uh, knowledge about this particle to Bob. So what she can do she can do some quantum manipulation, quantum computing manipulation is A and C, then measure A and send information about measurement A to Bob. So sending information about measurement of A to Bob is a classical process. Uh, it is, uh, you should use normal uh, mail. You have to actually go to Bob and say, I measured this one. But after a moment, the Bob knows what happened with particle A, he can uh, automatically uh, experimentally confirm what happened to what is particle C was. And uh, this particle B uh, becomes actually the same as the original particles. So this state here was teleported here. So it feels super strange that, uh, okay, we speak about, uh, we give information about particle A, do, do we get any, any useful mass of this? And the answer is the following one. Uh, when we measure A, it can be either red or blue. We pass in classical information in, in computer language zero and one. However, particle C can be in any uh, possible uh, combination. It is controlled by complex numbers A1 and A2. So states in which particle C can be is much more. There are much more states. So by passing classical information zero and one through classical channel, we able to teleport after Z, after E plus classical information, quantum information, which is not just red or blue, but combination with any numbers. And again, uh, this was done on experiment. First time it's 143 kilometers away, particle was teleported, and later, uh, 2017, it was teleported from a uh, space uh, satellite to Earth. So it's actual experiment that confirms the theory. Um, okay, so uh, uh, now uh, we're going to the last part, uh, which is probably the most exciting is quantum computing. Uh, before we start, uh, I need to say these words because then it will be more clear understanding. In classical world, we have either options, two options, either red or blue, only two options. In quantum world, again, we can do any combination of red and blue with any numbers. So number of options that we can have is much, much bigger because A1 and A2 can be any numbers, not zero and one, but any number. So uh, this is uh, this combination is called quantum bit or qubit, and it contains much possibility to store much more information. In principle, infinitely many information, but uh, in practice, we have uh, practical limitations. So it will be just very large. And uh, you, you know that when you do computation, you need, to, you need not only one bit, but at least two, and then you have to make like addition, multiplication of them. So then two particles will be two bits. And again, we can combine them in a different way. This is arbitrary numbers, completion amplitude. And this will create opportunity to create new type of uh, operations, which will replace normal logic with uh, analog of quantum computation logic. So the power of quantum computing is the possibility to superpose and together things with arbitrary numbers. This is actually where power comes from. Creating these options uh, in reality is hard. 
And here uh, I will pass, uh, uh, we will come to a specialist in quantum computing, Jakob Maricic, who will speak over Zoom and he'll he tell us what people know these days about quantum computing in reality. Uh, so I hope Jakob is here. Yeah. And uh, I think we need a uh, uh, small pause to change computer. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? No, not yet. Testing. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jakub Marczyk, and I'm at the Czech Technical University in Prague. But previously, I have worked at the IBM Research for almost eight years, and some part of that uh, I spent uh, within quantum computing. Uh, so today I will give a very high level uh, overview of quantum computing, uh, which in some ways is maybe the most sexy of the uh, technologies benefiting from quantum phenomena, although by no means the only one. Uh, so first uh, we will consider that as a social phenomenon um, second, we'll go to the implementations, and uh, then we'll ask why you should care. Uh, so, as a social phenomenon, um, quantum computing is in some ways truly fascinating as one of the many exponentially growing technologies out there. Uh, so, maybe the chart on the right could be one of the more persuasive. So this is private investment in quantum computing companies. And you would see that for many years, this was relatively uh, small amounts of money in maybe single digit millions. And suddenly in the past couple of years, uh, even the private investors are putting uh, maybe single digit billions into this per year. And this is, um, even more so in uh, the government circles. So many governments are now putting uh, even more billions of this time private, uh, of this time public funding into quantum computing uh, led by China who has pledged over uh, 15 billions. And I should like to say that the numbers here come from McKinsey December 2021 uh, report, but they are based on public figures and those may be actually an understatement of the uh, true extent. Uh, this is also reflected in the interest in uh, terms of publishing. So uh, the numbers of papers within quantum computing have grown exponentially and uh, to give you a glimpse of the uh, landscape here, really there are maybe 60 odd uh, companies within the quantum hardware. Uh, there are many suppliers of components. There are maybe hundreds of companies who focus on designing algorithms for quantum computers. And uh, the top management consultants at just McKinsey now essentially provide the following advice to all of the CEOs of any industries whatsoever. And that's to sort of a set up in-house quantum computing uh, research units, which would prepare them for the upcoming disruption to their businesses. So while this disruption is very hypothetical, uh, at least the uh, management consultants and increasingly many CEOs believe that it is well worth to prepare for it um, as a form of insurance, if you like. So what is this uh, sort of a disruptive technology really? So you have just seen the notion of a qubit. So unlike in the digital computers, which uh, we use daily, where you have the two values of a unit of information, which is bit, sort of a values up or down or um, one and zero. 
uh, here you really have an analog computer in the sense that uh, you, in a single qubit, expect to be able to store two complex values and up to normalization. So you can represent the two complex numbers really as a unit vector in the three space. And that's, that's precisely the block sphere, which you see in the picture on the right. So sort of any rotation in the three space, or any rotation of the unit vector will be a valid uh, state in the block sphere representation. So that's really for one qubit. But the fascinating part comes when you consider what happens beyond the uh, one qubit. And really now uh, many vendors uh, offer 127 qubits and expect to offer uh, many more qubits uh, in the years to come. So if you think about the state of the 127 qubit system, that's two to the 127 complex numbers modulo the normalization. So that's a lot of complex numbers. And uh, there are many important sort of information theoretic questions which uh, are spawned by this, like how we can efficiently load data onto uh, a quantum computer, how we can read off data from quantum computer essentially restricting the computations with high numbers of qubits to some very much uh, snake at an elephant pattern where you need to have very sort of a succinct input, then you can eat uh, the elephant and uh, sort of uh, make full use of this uh, high dimensional Hilbert space. And then again, sort of uh, produce some very succinct output. Now, sort of, uh, that's the theory. In practice, in the practical implementations, the key question is really how many operations can you perform within the lifetime of a qubit? And that's really the ratio of uh, um, the time it takes to perform a single operation and the lifetime of the qubit. Now, um, there are many sort of a technologies which uh, can be used to implement the qubit. But when you look on the outside, essentially all of them look the same because all of them are housed in a very expensive cryostat, um, sort of a piece of hardware which um, lowers the temperature substantially. And then within the many sort of a shielding and uh, successively lower temperature uh, allowing chambers of the cryostat, there sits a printed circuit board, which looks just like your ordinary computer. And uh, there is a sort of a certain number of qubits on the chip. And associated with this, you would have a rack full of room temperature electronics, which really uh, feed the signals to the uh, chip and then read off the signals from the chip. But what exactly is on the chip sort of uh, varies widely. There are many competing technologies. This is only a small uh, sampling, which uh, work at very different temperatures. And really, when you look at this uh, sort of a plot on the right, uh, we live sort of uh, at temperatures which are sort of uh, somewhere here, right? So sort of uh, 270 plus uh, Kelvin. And uh, the most sort of a temperate qubit technologies um, are based on double quantum dots where some people sort of uh, uh, believe that 20 Kelvin would be doable. Others talk about maybe four Kelvin range. Then there are superconducting qubits which really require um, the millikelvin range in terms of the temperatures. And uh, because the, the, that's sort of inherent to the technology because at those temperatures, you get the superconducting effects. And then there are even sort of a colder uh, uh, qubits, which uh, are really uh, based on neutral atoms, for instance, and live at microkelvins. So sort of a, for someone who is not 
into the applied physics, this is really quite fascinating that you can reliably cool something to micro Kelvins. But this is this this can be done. This is the engineering side of physics. So um, now in the uh, first uh, of the technologies I'd like to mention, maybe more than in a single sentence, uh, I could mention the superconducting qubits, right? And that th this has something which has really sparked most of the recent interests because that's what IBM uses and calls Transmon and what Google uses and calls Xmon. And really uh, over the past uh, sort of a 20 years, this is a log linear plot of the lifetime over the years. And you will see that sort of a from uh, sort of a sub microsecond uh, lifetimes, we have now grown to um, maybe a millisecond or such like. So the details of how do you measure this, this is again sort of a, um, uh, maybe a detail too much, but sort of a, the big picture here is that um, this is based on something called the Joseph effect, which sort of a, is sort of a 1960s physics, which is one of the nicest sort of a macroscopic uh, quantum effect really. And that makes it possible for the superconducting circuit with a particular uh, a gate called Josephson junction to behave essentially as an enharmonic quantum oscillator. And you can address this oscillator at microwave frequencies, five gigahertz, similar to Wi-Fi. And so you can, you would have one frequency for setting the state, one frequency for reading out the state. And uh, this way your sort of a qubits look a lot like Wi-Fi antenna on a chip, uh, lots of them actually, and uh, need to be cooled to about 10 millikelvin. There are more ambitious maybe technologies uh, for instance, this is a paper from this April uh, from the Harvard uh, Center for Ultra Cold Atoms. And ultra cold, they mean really ultra cold. So this lives at uh, micro Kelvins, and those are neutral atoms manipulated with 2D array of optical tweezers. And you can really uh, get much longer a lifetime of the qubits, but the single operation will also be slower than what you can get with the superconducting qubits. So that's maybe two examples out of a vast sort of a array of technologies that could be used to implement the qubit. Now, uh, within this uh, sort of a vast array of technologies, essentially all of them implement very similar uh, class, of sometimes known as universal quantum computation. And what you can do in this universal quantum computation uh, in polynomial time is uh, modeled by a particular class uh, in theoretical computer science. So if you have never seen this, this may look a bit obscure, but uh, the take home message here is that we have actually a very good understanding of what any of those uh, classes or, or technologies should be capable of, and that they are in some ways um, equivalent. But an important sort of a realization is that quite likely they are uh, distinct from what the Turing computer can do. In particular, they may be able to do more than the Turing computer. Uh, so some problems can be solved exponentially faster. And that's indeed why the general public has uh, sort of uh, been very much interested in quantum computing recently. Uh, so in the news, you have surely noticed the claims of quantum supremacy uh, coming from Google and uh, from a group at the University of Science and Technology in China. So in both cases, these were very particular experiments 
uh, not necessarily of any useful kind, but those were experiments which were performed very fast on the quantum computer and which would be very hard to calculate classically, demonstrating this exponential speed up. Uh, so while we still wait for uh, such an exponential speed up to be demonstrated on a problem that would be practically useful, uh, this really, I think, gave um, much more hope to many people that this sort of a useful exponential speed up will be available at some point. And indeed, sort of a, anyone can play with this. So for most of the vendors um, of quantum computing, um, there is a, an online version available in some batch mode processing. You submit your job, you wait until it finishes, then you get the results. And you can either sort of access these using a library called Qiskit. So in Python, you say pip install Qiskit and it installs everything you need or uh, through Amazon. So Amazon's uh, quantum computing service is called Amazon Bracket. So either way, you can actually run on the actual quantum computers uh, for free for some very small instances. And uh, if you, and I presume that many of you do, have an interest in uh, physics or chemistry, um, I think that there is like an extra level of interest uh, coming from really the observation down to Feynman that if you have a quantum mechanical effect, for instance, electronic structure problems in quantum chemistry or computing the ground state energy of some fermionic Hamiltonian or such, uh, essentially you try to simulate the quantum mechanical uh, nature and um, doing it on a quantum computer uh, should be particularly uh, well uh, matched. Uh, so there are a lot of papers in this direction um, spawned to a large extent by 1996 paper by Seth Lloyd who has claimed in science, this is the first page, that uh, there is an exponential quantum advantage. It turns out that the situation is somewhat more complicated, um, as has been shown most prominently by Kitaev. But really, like this is the stuff of nature cover articles recently. And if you like to learn more, there is a, a wealth of resources uh, which you can uh, learn from including uh, this recent survey, for instance. Uh, so the main picture here is that you need to prepare a state which has um, an overlap with the ground state, which does not decrease exponentially with the number of electrons or um, such. But then uh, you, if, if you can do this, then this is the as the overlap, uh, you can get a polynomial uh, time in uh, the error in, uh, for the rest. And this really is, uh, uh, in a way, a breakthrough. So this would make it possible if you can guess the, mm, some part of the uh, ground state uh, using some variational method, it would make it possible for you to then compute the ground state or the energy of the ground state uh, reliably in polynomial time on the quantum computer. And uh, similarly, uh, similar technologies, essentially in the case of the Ising Hamiltonian, can be used to work with many traditional optimization problems. So when people think about uh, many problems of combinatorial optimization, um, they tend to think about problems such as MaxCut. And uh, while essentially the state of the art here is very much uh, not what it should be, um, there are 
uh, well-performing algorithms, um, which give some hope that this will eventually develop. So uh, these are some of the uh, sort of early results here. And this is uh, sort of a, where I would like to stop and I can take any questions if there are. Please, can you show what is on the last slide? Like uh, this table you showed. I mean, take one and tell what does it mean. Right. So these are uh, full ensembles of a particular problem known as MaxCut, uh, which is a sort of a prototypical problem in combinatorial optimization, closely linked to the Ising Hamiltonian. And people know since the work of Kitaev that the ground state characterization for the Ising Hamiltonian, actually even a three local Hamiltonian, um, is what's known as QMA complete. So people believe that this is in some ways the most difficult uh, problem for the quantum computer, but uh, still people try uh, to de design algorithms uh, for uh, the problem. And um, so there is a huge number, like literally hundreds of papers um, um, that look, try to devise variational algorithms for uh, this particular problem of determining the ground state energy of the Ising Hamiltonian or solving the max cut on a quantum computer. And so the um, ugly truth here is that up until last year, uh, the uh, algorithms, uh, which would be the state of the art on the quantum side, essentially did not perform as well as what you can do in poly time on the classical computer. And uh, that's maybe bad news. The good news is that if you start from an initial state, which is really the best you can do uh, in poly time uh, classically, and this is really something we understand rather well. That is, we understand rather well what are the limits uh, um, of approximability of MaxCut or such on the classical computer. Uh, we can improve over this on the quantum computer in uh, uh, the experiments. And I think that's quite sort of a convincing. Now, um, we obviously would like to support this with better theory, uh, but that's still sort of uh, to be done. So what we can sort of show at this point is that the quantum computer um, running the uh, solver for the optimization problem uh, will perform at least as well as the best uh, classical solver, which it will uh, sort of a start from uh, the output of. Um, but uh, whether it can perform strictly better, we cannot prove yet. And that's a very sort of a fascinating question, I think, because um, unlike the problems where the quantum supremacy has been really shown in, uh, in the papers we have so far, the combinatorial optimization is something which is really solved in um, many walks of life on a routine basis. So when you order something from Amazon or when you um, need to plan the routes of some vehicles or when you do 
uh, sequencing of a genome uh, in all kinds of these problems you solve some combinatorial optimization problems so if we were able to achieve the supremacy in the sense of at least sort of uh, computing the value faster not necessarily exponentially faster that would be a big deal so Jakob we also have a question from Yuri uh, mm -hmm. he asks how theory of category can be applied in quantum computations all right so i'm afraid i know very little about the category theory so um, i have to demure on this one uh, i know some people who know more about the category theory so i could maybe pass the question uh, on if you release his contact details or send me an email Any more questions? No. So, Jakub, thank you very much. So, we'll Thanks so much. Okay, so that sends up uh, this meeting today. So thank you for coming. And I just want to put thanks to everybody who participated in the in the preparations. There were quite a few people here who we mentioned here that make this event possible. So yes, I want to tell you that uh, actually every, everybody is good in what his professional is in. Uh, what we are doing now is not our ordinary job and when we were preparing lectures there were really many troubles which we never thought about before so it was a big challenge organizational sending announcements was super hard preparing for lectures was very difficult I and mean, it was uh, very different from what you would do in normal scientific public uh, talk and i would really thank to all the people uh, who helped in different ways and made this possible and we still have to survive for one month and really many things will happen. We will go through very different, uh, interesting uh, stories in nature. And uh, yeah, we will keep working. So you're welcome to come to this event. And uh, special thanks to Dorian Duart who drew this nice picture. I probably can tell quickly what it is. So this is a Schrodinger cat, which is uh, decomposed into uh, main lights that we see by eye. And this is actually a plaque horse later, which audience uses uh, to, to travel uh, between different worlds. So for us, this horse is our tool. So actually here is there is a bits, one zero, one zero, the so integrals. This is a Feynman diagram. And so we use we'll use this horse to travel between worlds of physics uh, as Odin bit uh, in, in Nordic mythology. Now this is of course black hole, and these are waves. So we will have another event about waves, and that one will be not, there will be actually experiment, which we'll see. So the experimentalist will give the next talk about wave, it will be in Uppsala in two weeks, and actually there he promised to bring device and to show how it works. So it will, I, should, I think it will be very exciting, and I really look forward to see how it will work. Uh, yeah, so this event was supported uh, by Nordit and uh, Studio for Budnet uh, and uh, Just to notice that uh, charity part of this is a private initiative and whatever support is given is given for uh, outreach event, right? So charity is a, is a private question. It works as private person in this. So thank you for coming and welcome for the next lectures. Mm. Yeah.